So now to tonight's keynote uh, presenter. Um, this is a picture he particularly likes to recite. So, uh, so that was why I chose it. Um, it's particularly good. Um, Avalanche Software was founded in Utah 20 years ago this month, and as an independent developer, they created original IP and licensed games for just about every major gaming platform. Titles, include, titles included games such as sports games, rather such as NCAA 2K College Football and Open Ice Hockey, that I know is a passion for them. Avalanche, right? Uh, several versions of Mortal Kombat, the TAC series, and a couple of games based on the Rugrats show. Then when it was almost 10 years old, Avalanche Software was acquired by Buena Vista Games, and Avalanche quickly claimed its place as a leader among Disney's game studios, turning out hits based on major IP, but especially uh, Pixar IP, such as Bolt, Cars 2, and Toy Story 3. Then they created a line of games that worked with real toys, and Disney Infinity was born. It was created here at Avalanche, here in Utah, and is one of Disney Interactive's most significant product ranges. John Blackburn is Avalanche's CEO. Uh, he's been a supporter of game development in Utah for all of those 20 years, making high quality product and keeping many developers employed while big companies and small studios came and went. No matter which criteria you choose, John and Avalanche are uh, uh, one of the real success stories of digital entertainment here in Utah. Through thick and thin, John has remained a real professional, consistent, reliable, and one of the nicest people in the business locally. I'm delighted to welcome to you, Newton, John Blackburn. John. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first off, I'd just like to thank you for having me out uh, tonight. It's it's always uh, cool to come and support the local community um, as far as development. Like John said, I've been here. Um, I think I started in games in '92. Uh, so I worked with Jeff actually back then at Sculpture Software, and so Jeff asked me to just kind of give both our history, what we've done at Disney some of the numbers that we've done on Infinity, and so it, this is kind of a smattering of stuff. I'll try to go through it pretty quickly, just so that we can get to questions and answers, or beer, maybe later. Uh, so, uh, as, as John said, so I was a co-founder of Avalanche back in 95, and that's a lot of what I feel like I can offer some of the people here, is just, I've been running a company here for a long time, and we started out as a small developer, we were like four of us. Um, We've been through an acquisition by a major uh, company, so we've got a lot of experience there. We did, you know, got close a few times with other major publishers before Disney actually purchased us. Um, I've been working for Disney for uh, 10 years. Uh, I've now worked for a major film company and been promoted, and we've done a lot of uh, successful stuff there. But all this kind of started years ago. I was I was a graduate from U or, sorry from Weber State in computer science, and so I started off as a programmer, transitioned more into as designer and then management over the course of the years, so I've kind of done quite a few different things over the course of time. So, to give you more of the story of like what I feel like the key pieces of the games that we did at Avalanche, <coughs> I broke them out into these categories. Um, we've done 35, but the first set of games on here are all games that somebody else had done. They were all ports of some other game. We were using somebody else's engine, somebody's code, and for really the first five years, we learned how to make games by making other people's games on different systems. So if that was a coin-op game, we'd go ahead and port that over to the Super Nintendo or the PlayStation or whatever else. Um, sometimes we extended those games. We'd take like the NFL 2K uh, or games, make the college versions of that, so some limited uh, extra content. And then the next big leap for us was we made our own engine. And so we took a lot of uh, time, we took a lot of the funds that we were putting away on the side as profits and spent that on our own engine development. And back in the day, before Unity and all the other things and kind of consistent tools, that was a pretty big deal because there were a ton of different engines. And before Renderware came along, there really wasn't a, a system that everybody agreed on was kind of superior to what all of the different proprietary engines were. One of the things that enabled us to do was start making original games based off other people's licenses. We did a couple of Rugrats games. Uh, at that point in time, we had made a, a relationship with Nickelodeon to where we were able to pitch for, they wanted to make a TV series that was a game first, TV series second. And so we went up against about 30 other companies uh, for the pitch for that, and Tack and the Power of Juju was accepted as that game that became a TV series. So, 
We did those three. We had a TV series that was made out of it that flopped. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> and then we went down in like eight episodes or something. So if you want to watch all of them, you can binge watch it in about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, but after that, one of the things that did do is we really started specializing in kids' games. And so from a game perspective, it was one of the first platformer games that had been successfully launched in quite a while um, outside of, say, Ratchet and Clank or Jack and Daxter at the time. So Disney got interested in us and had us come start working on the first time we did for those guys was Chicken Little. And during Chicken Little, this is now probably I think 2004, 2005, something along those lines, budgets in the games industry had been going up and up over the course of the years. I think our first budget that we had on any of these games was $200,000 for the port of Mortal Kombat. Now, fortunately for us, we made millions in royalties at that point in time, and that made up for a lot of stupid business decisions we would make over the course of the next few years. We actually didn't take any of that money out of the company. We just let it sit. And that's probably one of the best things that we did was we were horrible businessmen when we started. We felt like we were good game developers, but we did not know anything about running a business. And particularly, uh, we had uh, a, this idea that Everything could just be run flat. We didn't need any management structure. We would be 100% egalitarian across the whole company. And I've got, if there's questions about that, I can tell you why that's maybe a bad idea after it gets to be about six people. But the thing that it did happen for us was over the course of the years, we could never really hit a great quality bar with the titles that we made because we always were working with budgets that were quite a bit smaller than what our competition was. And so, if you look at what was going on at the time when TAC was out there, I believe our budget for that was about four and a half million dollars, whereas Jack and Daxter that year was 15 million. So they got Game of the Year as a platformer, we were honorable mention. So we always felt good that we were doing well with the resources that we had. Now a lot of that was because Utah is a lower cost labor center and there's a bunch of different things that are, that went into that because we could utilize some of the technology we had, we could utilize the fact that we do a bunch of different games on a bunch of different systems. So we had some strengths we could leverage, but really we didn't get into the high Metacritic scores until we got to Toy Story 3 and Cars 2. Now, where those ones came in is the budgets jumped by about five to six times. Um, it wasn't like a small bet. These were huge bets that Disney was willing to take on some of their best franchises. So, uh, at the same time though, the video games industry was going down from a licensed game standpoint. The quality on most licensed games was becoming less and less. People didn't really want to spend as much on them. They had a reputation for being horrible. All of you probably stopped buying them at that point in time. Um, and as Disney, we really need to figure out a way as to how are we going to survive in this industry. And so uh, that's where Disney Infinity came from. So I'll get into that in a little bit, but it was actually a platform strategic play for Disney as opposed to just a one-off game that we were going to go make. So, told Jeff I'd share numbers and stats and stuff. So, in 95, we were 11 employees. Uh, our entire budget for the year was about 750000 As we As we moved through, uh, just went to 2005, that's when Disney acquired us, and so I had kind of easy, easy numbers on that. Um, so, as, as things went on, we really had to start learning how to run a company quite differently uh, over the course of time. Um, I think the big thing is, is as you start getting to scale, People expect way different things from you from a management company. When a company like Disney buys you, they expect way different things once again. Um, I didn't really give the, the real number on the bottom because my boss will probably be mad and Jeff's going to post this online. So, um, but it's, it's uh, substantially bigger than that, actually. So, um, so what I wanted to do is just uh, go through then what Infinity has meant for us uh, as a business. It really was the thing that saved our studio uh, in a lot of ways. As, as John mentioned, uh, Disney had uh, five internal studios. We're the last one left. Um, so we have been through kind of this winnowing circumstance over the course of the last number of years as it got harder and harder to do licensed family games. So uh, this is the launch trailer uh, that we showed at D23. There are stories waiting to be told, living inside each of us in endless combinations. Stories of loss and triumph, villains and heroes, 
destruction and creation. The time has come for you to tell those stories. The time has come to play. This whole idea of just playing how you want to really kind of inspired us. We've come up with a fantastic tool chest for creativity. If you can do it, you can do it! Disney Infinity. Disney Infinity. Disney Infinity! There's never been anything quite like it before. So cool. Oh, yeah. nice, guys. Disney Infinity is moving forward with the second phase of their operation. Anyone who's a fan of Disney and Marvel is going to be blown away by what's been created here. I really love this game and I think you brothers would love it too. They get to be their own narrator of whatever story they decide to create. And I get to be part of their world. Ooh. Check it out! It's a dream to be able to work on a Star Wars game. Marvel characters against Star Wars characters. That sounds pretty cool. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sadness is my favorite. So as far as just some of the other numbers, I don't want to put them up on slides. Uh, Infinity One did over 550 uh, million. Um, we're now over, we're well over a billion, um, but kind of on our way to two. Uh, so this has been a fairly healthy business. Who knew that if you added toys to a video game, it would sell a lot of games. So the franchise strategy that we had on this though was uh, we were investing a ton of money on each one of these standalone games, and all, some of them paid off really well. Toy Story we made a ton. But we would also be building games for Bolt, where we would lose our shirt. And the problem is, we were, we were creating enough that we were just barely breaking even. And if you're looking at a company like Disney, they really want a, a kind of a standard return on investment for Wall Street. And so we needed to make sure that we were capable of providing that return on investment. And that's really what all of this did. It allowed us to flexibly invest behind all of the different properties that Disney was going to make whether we make just one single IGP, uh, which is an interactive game piece, we can't call it a toy for legal reasons, um, uh, but we, you can sell just one of those, we can make a full play set, we, but building one structure that would allow all of these things to interact together was actually where this came from. So uh, from a content overview standpoint, obviously we're blessed. We've got a lot of the world's best brands um, at Disney. Uh, I've got a slide that I can't share yet that has all of the 3.0 stuff that we've just come out with. So 3.0 just came out in, in August. Um, Spider-Man's in for those, or sorry, not Spider-Man, uh, Star Wars is in it for those of you who don't know. But there's, uh, I think we've got about another uh, 10 franchise families that are now in, in Infinity uh, based on that. So as far as how we're doing business-wise, Skylanders came out uh, just you know roaring out of the gate with Skylanders. Uh, we, the first year we came out, we were, we took 43% market share. Uh, the following Christmas, we went up to 47% market share. Uh, this year, we think we'll actually be even better than that uh, as, as we go. So, we love this particular slide. I don't know if everybody's going to be able to see it or not, but uh, basically what this is, is uh, this half of the audience is parents playing this game as much as their kids. Um, this half of the audience is the kids playing and then it's broken up into the different demographics. This is also broken up into, there's all the little cons on the side that you really can't see. We're essentially 50-50 boys and girls. So for you film people out in the audience, 
when Disney's looking to look or to start a new film, we always look for it to be four quadrant before we're going to go drop two hundred fifty million dollars on the thing. And this four quadrant is this is when you go you know get a billion dollar film. And the idea behind the four quadrants is young and old, male and female. So you do the breakdown and you get basically this is a film for everybody, right? This game is for everybody, and that's why we're being as successful as we are. So this one's also just saying that uh, parents play as much as their kids. As far as just uh, Infinity 3, moving forward into that, this is just kind of like the stats that we do. We localize this into 13 different languages. We're in pretty much every territory uh, where they actually play video games. Um, we're on every platform that you can possibly be. We just added Apple TV this year. Uh, the, the different development teams that we work with, Avalanche was the heart of this, and, and like I said, we've got about 270 people here, but we've got over 500 people in development on this game worldwide right now. So, uh, Studio Gobo, Ninja Theory, and Sumo Digital are all in the UK. Uh, we are working with, I would think, about 150 people there. Uh, we've got United Front Games that we're working with out of Vancouver. We've got about another 40 there. As well as we've got other developers, uh, Heavy Iron down in LA, Panic Button in Austin, Blind Squirrel uh, kind of down by San Diego, and then Perfect World in China. And so we're pretty much spread across the globe on this thing. Um, I'll go ahead and show some stuff on Infinity 3 and then get into some of the more businessy kind of stuff as far as running a small company. Visitors, let's hope they come in peace. Other content and characters sold separately. How about a hug? <laughs> I like you. <laughs> so, uh, we, we've determined you can put like anything in that store and make it in the closet. Um, so, it's, it's great. Um, so we've got an Accolades trailer. This has actually been the highest quality game Avalanche has ever made. We, we hope that uh, kind of the investment that Disney's made behind us and the amount of uh, money that we'll put behind this product has really paid off. And so um, here is what uh, the critics are saying. Disney Infinity 3.0 is here and the critics have spoken. One of the best Star Wars games that I've ever played. Rebel Scum. Absolute blast. blast! Looks like we have visitors. Whoa! A plus, the family game to get for 2015. Whoa! Disney Infinity 3.0. You can get the starter pack to begin your adventure. Content and characters sold separately. Rated everyone 10 and up. To be able to take that and then take it to mass manufacture, and then to also learn how to make toys at the same time, we ended up doing it on a really tight time frame that was people in the toy industry didn't really think that was possible. So when we were developing the reader hardware, we ended up having to do a, a, a few different tricks to really just try to get the price of the manufacturing as low as possible. It was actually very easy to build this, but to build it at a price to where you could get a $75 starter pack was something that was incredibly difficult. Um, the thing we didn't realize when we started off was it's like, hey, we've got all these toys and the models. How do we just turn them in? Or we've got all these models, but we can make it into toys. Shouldn't that be an easy process? And it's, there is so much more to making a toy and all of the tools. And then the, the crazy thing is, is when you start thinking you have to build billions, or not billions, millions of each one of these things. We built over 100 million toys in, in two and a half years right now. So when you start breaking that down to how many get built per second, it starts to become like a really large number. And so when you take a toy, all of them are handmade. These, these things are not done by machine. Um, it's, it's all done in China. 
but when you break them out, they're all plastic injection molded. Um, I should write, write a video of this piece. Um, they, they look like an old tester model that you would, you know, kind of break the pieces off. The, the, the edges get cut off, they get assembled in those in that same way, and then they get hand painted. And so there's a bunch of different tools that they use to hand paint those, but uh, we've got just videos of like 5,000 people sitting on a factory line just building these things uh, uh, as it goes. Quality control becomes a huge issue. Like we had, you know, like a whole, a whole crate, and when I say a whole container, and so that's something like, I don't know, 10,000 toys or something like that that had the wrong RFID tags in them so that when you put down Tondo, it was the Lone Ranger. Um, there's just all these stupid things that you really don't understand about trying to run the toy business, which uh, we have fortunately gotten much better at, but um, just sourcing factories. We work with 19 different factories right now uh, in China, so we've got people you know, kind of on the ground over there a, a lot of the time. From a supply chain standpoint, anything from you know buying plastic to testing to then making sure that they're getting here to the U.S. Um, we actually run everything out of Technicolor in, in Detroit, so we've got literally a, a, a warehouse that is as big as five Costco's full of Infinity Toys when we, when we load up at the beginning of the year. The reason we have to do that is since it takes a year in advance, we have to guess how many we're going to make. So we really don't know how many we're going to sell. So we think that we're going to sell you know, 1.5 million or something. You go ahead and just cross your fingers, you place that order. It's a really high stakes poker game. Um, and then obviously there's retail sales and how do you get uh, all the shelf space that you need? How do you work with all the, the retailers? On Infinity One, I believe we had in North America, um, I think we had 27 miles of shelf space uh, in all the different stores when you added it all together in, in linear feet. Uh, we, uh, this year we're up to about 50. Um, uh, in the UK, as uh, another one that I just, we have 19 miles there uh, in a much smaller territory. So these things are really crazy. It's just how do you get all the right things on all the right pegs? It's been, it's been a ride. Um, I'll hurry you go through all of this other stuff. Just um, on the software development side, it was a challenge because we've never built a game where your character could change at any point in time. So literally at any moment, you could be in a load screen, you could be in your victory dance at the end of the, uh, the cutscene, you could be in a cutscene. We really had to go through and change the way we thought about making games. Part of the problem was is on the memory concerns, you really don't know what's going to be in memory at any one time. We, we didn't have a handle on, particularly in the creator mode, which things you had put into the game and had to create some pretty new technical solutions in just dealing with memory maps and how we stream things in. Um, everything has to work together in the toy box. This has been one of the hugest challenges for us. As we started to bring other developers on board, it wasn't like they were making a standalone executable where they were working in their own Perforce repository or anything else. We've got 500 people working in the same code base at the same time. We break it eight times every day for everybody. We have to do continuous integration. We have to start building tools to where you can't check in until the next day. There's a bunch of things that change the very way that you develop the game just based on the size of the team because everything has to work together at the end of the day. This can't be something that's just standalone and that you add on it at the end. Um, the snowball rolling downhill is the bane of my existence right now. Every character we add to this game always has to work with the next with the next version. So there's a tax that we pay for Buzz Lightyear to move forward into Infinity 2 and Infinity 3 and continue to move forward as we go. So every year, it's not just development work, it's also testing. As we go through and put in more mounts and more vehicles, the grid that you go through and make on a spreadsheet of does Buzz Lightyear gear work in every vehicle, with every weapon, with every mount, in every gameplay mode, it's crazy. It takes us forever to test this game. It usually takes five hours, or sorry, five days for um, five testers all working on different parts of the game for a full playthrough, just to make sure that we've tested everything. So um, it's very difficult to find uh, bugs. We've also got, uh, we really thought, the community on this and Disney creativity would be something that we wanted to sell. So user-generated content was something that we really wanted to make sure that we supported. That's also caused a lot of bugs because year to year, people want those toy boxes they made on Infinity 1 to still work on Infinity 2 and Infinity 3, and we end up having to test those as well. So there's other challenges there. And then at the very last piece, 
we're very involved with our community. We have a show called Toy Box TV uh, on every week, and the the community builds things for us and provides new content. It's it is a huge win, and so as far as we're concerned, it's really worthwhile to support the user generated content because we know that it's extending the amount of time people are playing the game, and we know from our BI data that anybody who downloads user generated content buys more toys. So we know that it makes us more money. So at the end of the day, we do a lot of these things for kind of business reasons. Um, Jeff asked me to talk a little bit about pros and cons in Utah for us. So the biggest pro for us was these existing talent base. I mean, we knew a lot of people here. There had been a lot of studios that had started, you know, kind of early on. I would say, you know, the mid mid nineties to two thousand was probably the heyday of game development here in Utah. We had quite a quite a big talent pool, especially for the number of people uh, in the population base. Uh, the schools are fantastic for us. Uh, both the University of Utah, um, the games program there, uh, a lot of times the programmers uh, that are coming out of there. We've done internships with them for a long time. But uh, BYU has one of the best, uh, you know, graphics, uh, computer graphics arts programs in the nation. We oftentimes are competing against Pixar for the guys there. Um, one of the things we end up doing is we intern people at Avalanche, and then they get full-time jobs at Pixar. So it's been uh, something that's pretty cool for us. Um, obviously, the proximity to the West Coast for us is huge. I mean, most of the game publishers are out there, and so as we were a smaller company, um, it was an easy flight for them to get out here. Uh, right now, as far as being part of Disney, it's also great because I travel there a lot. Um, and then I would say there, you know, there's a pro of attracting talent. And a lot of people think just because of the uh, reputation of Utah and kind of the predominant religion that everybody might hear might be weird or whatever, or you can't drink in Salt Lake. There's all of these things that you know kind of come in as the as the predis predispositions. Um, we attract talent by drinking a lot and making people not believe that. <laughs> but the, uh, um, the real thing that people are moving here for is actually quality of life. Um, a lot of people have come here out of California, out of some of the high uh, cost of living centers that are really just ready to settle down and, and have a family. And, and it's easy. And so we can sell people on that pretty easily. On the cons, I will say the tax structure here is we're nowhere near competitive with any of the other major centers. Um, since I run the business now for Infinity, it's my job to choose where we're going to be doing this, and I'm signing the check. And so I, I know how much money that uh, Vancouver or Montreal or even the new tax incentives from Austin, they, they kill us. And so for us to grow here versus for us to grow in another labor center where the government's going to give quite a bit of uh, uh, payback for that, it's actually kind of difficult. And so I have to say that's a con. I, I tell the uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development anytime I get a chance. Um, but I will now flip around on the cons, attracting talent here. Um, the size of the industry is when we lose uh, a candidate right now, it's because they're afraid if they move here, it may not be permanent. That if, if Disney were to close down, where else are they going to work? And so I think it's very important for from an outreach standpoint for organizations like this to exist so that we can, as a grassroots, build a, a an industry here that people can believe in so that they will want to move in to, to the state. Um, and then the last one, I don't know if this impacts anybody else, but there's no direct flights to London and it kills me. Um, and so, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll blow through these last two. I'm, I'm running long here. And so uh, from, from a key learning standpoint, this is actually from an entrepreneur's conference that, that I did before. And uh, if you're starting your own company, I'll just have uh, a few things that I will recommend because these are landmines that I stepped on personally and would just think that I should share them. So, uh, clean books and good attorneys. We always had this, but I knew and have seen other companies that have gone through acquisition talks and had those things closed down on them because they didn't have these things. That the either their legal papers or the audit that happens when you do close out and get harvested, or it's make sure that you're buttoned up uh, from the beginning. Um, Know your partners. Uh, when we started Avalanche, we we went in very naively, thinking that we that the four partners were equal, and that we would always think the same thing, and that we would always equally share in carrying the weight, and have the hard conversations up front when nobody's pissed at each other um, is really what I would say because it is a divorce if you end up buying somebody out, and it is a very hard circumstance. So I can give details on that if people are interested. 
Um, I just put cash as king because for us, we always made decisions very differently when we started running low on funds. And that was generally not the best decisions that we made um, as a company. And we ended up getting kind of close a few times uh, over the course of the years before we were purchased. But um, just make sure that you don't take too much out of the company too soon. Uh, to try, to, try to put stuff aside. Retained earnings was the thing that surprised me most. We thought we were running a successful business. We were you know, making a million a year in profit or something, even when we were fairly small. And then when 500,000 of that goes away at tax time, it's, it's a real bite. And when you were looking at being in growth mode and that you are not going to be able to use all that profit to then fuel your growth, the retained earnings piece is really tough. So we structured our company as an LLC and we would get jacked into the highest tax brackets like right out of the gate because of that. Don't know maybe if uh, some other tax structures are better, um, but anyway, that's a uh, it was a key one for us because we could never grow as fast as we thought, even though we were profitable. Um, you know, for us over the course of the years, the best thing we've ever done is just build trust with employees and clients. Um, just being upfront and honest, we've been a fairly transparent shop. Um, I've got a ton of friends in the industry still. I always want to be able to shake their hand when I when I walk down the street, um, and so. Just, uh, I think, keep it above board has always been a, a big one for us. And then the worst mistakes we've ever made is when we manage on hope. Uh, we, we've known when we thought things were reasonable or not, and instead of planning for the best case uh, and, and working towards that, you got to plan for the worst. I mean, essentially, it's, things are usually never either side, um, but they're somewhere in the middle. But when you plan for the best, it usually ends up leaving you short somehow. So uh, those are just my little business things. From more of just the Disney side, I, I do feel like I have been very privileged to work with some of the most talented people uh, on the planet right now with this company. Uh, particularly, uh, Bob Iger is, uh, you know, I follow this man into the third level of hell uh, right now. I mean, he is probably the smartest, uh, one of the uh, highest level of integrity people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, and he was the guy who really understood that Disney needed to change after the Eisner days. And the fact that he then turned this around, was able to convince Steve Jobs that he should be able to buy Pixar, and then follow that up with Marvel, and Star Wars has just been you know, a fantastic run there. Um, Ed Gavel, who I sure, I'm sure a bunch of people here know too, um, is, if you haven't read his book, it's uh, on management and creativity, it's fantastic. Uh, but I would also just say that, you know, some of the stuff with Ed, he's, he's very poignant in understanding, I think, how to be creative and how to, how to run a creative organization. So, um, with that, I will open it up to questions. Particularly if you look at a lot of the candidates that are coming in, so I think any creative work, uh, any creative industry, you've got a lot of people trying to compete to get into that industry. And there's a lot of people who, are, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, are going to die to get in. Um, so I would, uh, who you're being compared against are people who have made demos, or I mean, oftentimes the student projects uh, are are really key. Um, I know that like coming out of the University of Utah right now, out of the EAE program. Those students usually come out with a demo reel, and we don't even have to ask them questions in an interview about um, topics that are kind of intellectual. Or you know, it's like, hey, explain the matrix multiplication to me. We ask them about the graphics engine that they used, and they tell us what goes on. We just know that they know how to use it. So I would say to build a demo right now is the easiest way to do it. But I know you touched base on this a little bit, but how was your transition from going to a small company with only managing, managing a few people, and then when did that huge transition happen to you where you're like, oh my gosh, we have 
way more pe many people than we previously had? How do I manage this big change? And from like a CEO standpoint, or from your founders and other team leaders? So I, I don't think our company felt any different from four people to 40. Once we hit 40, small things started to change. It wasn't a huge, it wasn't a huge shift, but it was um, things like people started to believe in clicks in the company and that we started to actually have to watch out for the way communication flowed. When it was 40 or less, everybody knew everything that was going on. Everybody was involved in almost everything in one way or another. The products were small enough that people could be involved. And so when we got up to, I mean, we've, we've talked about what the next magic number is. It was somewhat over 100. Um, I would say maybe up to 120. That's when I stopped knowing everybody's wife's and kids' names. And it changed things. And, and it wasn't just me. It was, it's hard to know 120 people's wives and kids' names. Um, and so we were a family before then. And after then, we didn't feel like a family anymore. We started feeling like a company. And I would say that it was right about that. We were growing pretty quickly through, through that range where it did start to feel different. Now, I would say the biggest change overall is when Disney acquired us, the things that people expect from a small independent developer in Utah versus the thing that they expect when they work for the Walt Disney Company are two different things and it happens overnight. And it's because when we were a small company, everybody was bought into the idea of making that company successful and that we could all, we all had a stake in making that company successful and so there was, we, we called it the, the carrot and the wolf. We always knew, we had royalty contracts on everything, and we knew that if we did a great job on a game, there, there could be royalties at the end of the day for all of us. But we were always afraid of failing. And so the wolf was always nipping at our heels. So we were chasing the carrot and running from the wolf, and we always had solidarity for purpose uh, at that point in time. As soon as you bring in a, a big company like Disney, that changes for everybody. That, that carrot's no longer really there because you have a very set bonus structure. You really, you have performance reviews and everything becomes very corporate. The whole wolf thing, while a bunch of other studios have closed, we always assume, well, it's Disney. I mean, you'll, we'll be here for a long time, right? So you lose a lot of the incentive. And I think that the biggest problem that we found with being acquired by Disney was our productivity dropped. And we had, to, it took us years to get that figured out and to get that back in line as to what actually motivated people in reality when it wasn't the wolf and the carrot. Yeah. So how did you find it was what do you what do you use to motivate your corporate? so the biggest thing that the is communication for us has been trying to make sure that everybody understands their part in this greater organization. It is so easy to think that what your contribution is on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't matter when you think that there's 249 other people working side by side. Uh, we had to really get a lot better at managing people uh, and we put a lot more management in place uh, because of this. Um, I think that the the other piece that did occur was as other studios did start to close down, people actually started to believe in our own mortality as a studio. Um, now, I will put it on the flip side. When we, probably our lowest morale ever was after we finished uh, a game we did with Bolt. Um, the, the film had been changed over and over again. I think uh, nine months before the film came out, it had a total rewrite where if you've seen Bolt, I mean, he's a dog that doesn't really talk to humans or anything. Nine months before that, he was a dog who did talk to humans, and he was like a super sleuth. Um, and so we had to completely change that game. The, the resultant product quality was bad. I mean, it was probably the worst game we've ever made. And morale just shot through the floor at that point in time. And we ended up having to build morale back up one product at a time. Um, by the time Toy Story 3 came out, it was really like, I mean, I, I kind of felt like probably like the best speech I've ever given was kind of like the Rudy Rudiger, let's get this Toy Story 3 thing done, so it was a live kind of speech. Um, and, and getting people bought into the morale that we were actually going to make quality products. We had to change the message and how we were going to do it and why we were going to do it, because it was no longer because we were going to make money, it was because we wanted to be the best at something in the industry, and everybody had to buy into that vision. 
Both. Um, we, we actually did the pitch um, two years before Skylanders was even announced. Uh, and so the, uh, but the last year we were able to course correct based on what they did. So, yeah. Can you talk about pitching a game idea? Like how do you get buy-in from other people, especially if you're trying to raise some venture capital money or like, like pitch, how do you pitch a game? Okay. When, um, that, that, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a tough question because you know now I'm sitting on the other side of the desk usually when, when this stuff happens. So um, I'll tell you what works at Disney right now. And, and this is more of a, it's, it's a business model rather than a, a one strict piece of creative content. What Disney loves is for a developer to come in and say, look, we are really good at this thing and we will take on half the risk and then we think that this gameplay mechanic that we have, so I'll take step pets so, you know, as an example, we think we could blow the doors out of this if we could use Mickey Mouse. We've already got everything working. We can show you what we've got. We want to use your ID. That is very successful with us right now um, because it's a proven gameplay mechanic that we can get behind and we can feel. And then we can understand what our brand value does when, when it comes to the table. So I can't really tell you what to do for like an electronic arts or somebody else, but we usually like the ones that are, hey, we did free fall, here's frozen free fall, or something along those lines. So it's it doesn't always have to be a proven commodity, but it does have to be something that people can buy into the vision. Yeah. What does Utah need to do, John, to become a team? It's the tax way. Yeah. It's like, what else do we need to do? What else can we do you did to try to um, get us fast internet every place? You know, I mean, I think that uh, we need to be perceived as a place where development happens, like we used to be. And, and I think that. It, it was interesting for me because when I used to go into games companies to pitch an idea or whatever, I mean, we went through all this stuff with TAC, games companies actually was like, oh, Utah's a place where games get made. Um, we don't have that perception anymore. And so it's a little bit of an uphill battle just right out of the gate to get companies to fund things here. So we might need to get a little bit louder um, with the successes that we've had, the size of the, of the community, um, some of the the opportunities and resources that are available, I think that there's probably something there where we can move the needle a bit with executives from either whether it be venture capital or or studios. Yeah. Um, when you think of like next iterations of what you do with the game, like how is that form? Do you usually go to like forums and find out what fans are thinking, or is it like mostly like executives deciding what's going to do, or like what do you <laughs> generate that? We throw darts at executives. Throw darts at a board. <laughs> um, the uh, really so there's 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 the creative games that we that moved us that you know made us want to do something for one reason or another. Right? It's usually what we played and what we liked and what we want to play with our kids right now. So um, I. I still play games, so hopefully I'm not an out-of-touch executive on, on this thing. Um, but yeah, there are other guys that we really don't allow to have too much of an input because they they look at this from a business standpoint and not from a product standpoint. Um, I am a firm believer that when, when the business guys start running things for the financial reasons, you start making bad calls and, and you know, it's easy to go back to, the, to Disney when feature animation, the Walt Disney Feature Animation Studios, their movie started to tank. And that was really because they had become no longer director focused. It was, those decisions were being made by the executives. Um, when Lasseter came in, he cleaned all that out and was like, look, this is now gonna be run by the creative people again. And if you look at all the films since then, the quality level has just gone through the roof in comparison. So when we're looking at what the next piece is, um, you, you can have an argument right now about how the games industry is run, particularly on microtransaction and uh, free-to-play models, where people are going in and saying, this gameplay mechanic matched up with this IP will provide you this amount 
of return on investment. That happens. Infinity is not really that, and so when we look at this, it's there's a few pillars that we try to hold to when we're saying, how do we tell better stories? How do we make this a more memorable experience for you to play this with your child on the couch together? How do we engage um, a different audience? And in general, I, we usually think of games as not as much female as male, and so that comes into play quite a bit. And then it's, what do you want to play? I mean, so it is, what have you played lately that inspires you? But there's still a bunch of games that we've patterned Infinity's play pattern off of that we still don't feel like we've nailed yet, and we're still trying to get that right. John, one last yeah. question for you then. So, what's, the best, what's your favorite game that Pat Lutz has ever played before? Um, I, I, have, I have a few. Um, the, probably the one I played the most was uh, NFL Blitz. I played the, the crap out of that thing, so I'm really good in case anybody wants to play. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, as far as the ones that we created though, TAC was special because it was the first one where we had made our own game and had done something a little bit new in the industry. And so we felt like we had brought something new to the table. Um, as far as just overall quality, I think that Toy Story 3 is the one that I, I look back on most fondly because we took a big risk on the toy box mode there and that's has, that paid off in Infinity later on. Um, so. Honestly, so the, like the pitch that I gave to Bob Iger for Infinity, because we were pitching for the company, right? It's like, hey, this is, I'm, I'm going in and I'm asking you for a, a very large number, of, <laughs> amount, amount of money. Um, and uh, there were four ideas in front of him that day, and the pitch that we did for him was we were explaining why Infinity tied into what he cared about most, which is Disney creativity. Uh, and how we could then leverage that into the other brands that, that we use. Um, but then, why it was going to matter for families. The ace that I had in the hole that I didn't realize was Bob had been playing Toy Story 3 toy box with his kids. And I didn't even really have to pitch him on it. He already understood him and walked in the door. And so it was a very easy pitch uh, for that reason. And so Toy Story 3 actually was, I think, was kind of the turnaround of Avalanche into a higher tier development. Thank you, everybody.